If you will, turn back in your Bible to the book of Isaiah, chapter 36, even though our meditation will be in chapter 37. Happy New Year, saints. You know, when we when you reach a certain age and you actually cross over into a new year, that becomes significant. Now, some of y'all know what I mean by that. You, we have these rough Novembers and Decembers, and we start asking ourselves, now, Lord, you, are you going to get me into the next year, or am I going home? And uh, so we have these different strategies. I don't know about you, but I do. Long ago, when I was a youngster, and I used to clown my way into the new year, Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Clowning your way into the new year. Like you just, you knew you was going to make it into, it wasn't even a doubt. You're going to party your way into the new year. Started early in the evening. And I'm counting in the new year like, you know, I'm the one controlling the seconds and the minutes. Now, New Year's Eve, I eat good around 7.30, and I start summarily making my way to the bed. <laughs> if I'm not going to make it into the new year, I'm going to be asleep when the Lord calls me. <laughs> Although I, me and Barbara went out this Saturday night, it was such a blessing because, uh, and, and, this will pertain to what we're talking about today. I hope I have your time today. We're dealing with a, what I think will be a very appropriate beginning of a series around understanding the whole concept of our New Year's theme, Isaiah 37, 21. We'll get into it. <clears throat> but we decided to kind of peruse our neighborhood, which is Castro Valley, and, and look for the homes that were celebrating Christmas and the New Year as we do. So, you know, I'm one of those guys that I put up my lights about a week and a half before, and I do it in increments, kind of like the Geico commercial. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> right, I do it in increments. A light here, two here, 10 here, 20 here. After a while, ding, they're flashing right. And uh, we've had years in the past where I've made this observation on my Monday show, which there, you know, I deal with theology and politics, our social issues, which are very important to us. I, I said years ago, because we have had in America and probably around the world as well, a continual kind of nagging uh, antipathy or apathy towards holiday seasons, particularly Christmas because Christmas is so radically God-centered and gospel-centered, our political and social elements of our world has always sought to systematically strip us of what Christmas really means. And you guys must know that one of the texts we will be dealing with today is Daniel 7.25. I won't unpack it, I'm just going to remark it. And it talks about wearing out the saints of the Most High God by changing times and seasons. And so what will happen is the people of God will come to discover that holidays don't carry the same meaning that they did once before. And that even the believer can get fairly apathetic about celebrating the birth of Christ or the resurrection of Christ. Would you agree with me? And you can begin to see it in your community. I remember several years ago, I don't know how long it was, but I would be driving home and I would recognize very little, you know, preparations, few lights in the homes. Now, years ago, we would have whole blocks celebrating together. Everybody would be setting up their little, you know, uh, representation of the celebration of, of the birth of Christ. But years ago, I began to watch how little by little the lights were going out. Now, that's spiritual. Right. Little by little, the lights were going out. 
And I said to myself and I said several times on our program, now, which one do you want? Do you want a year in, year out where there is absolutely no kind of acknowledgement of the reality of the penetration of the God of redemption into our world, which changed humanity forever? In the year 7 BC, 6 BC, when Christ assumed the human nature. Everywhere in the world, we call this the year of our Lord, Anno Domino. Because God actually came in and changed the times and seasons. He established the one substantial reset that humanity truly needs. And now we are on that precipice into darkness once again where people are very comfortable with not celebrating. First, we took Jesus out of the center of it and turned it into money-making materialism and secularism with Santa Claus and all of that other crap. And now even that is whittling down so that humanity is basically groping in darkness all over again. So me and my wife started perusing the neighborhoods and to our joyful surprise, do you know we found nice little neighborhoods off the beaten path where whole families were putting up their, their lights and their, their, their works. And it was such a beautiful thing to see because it requires labor to let people know you are acknowledging this day. And then my wife, as happy as she is, she says, you know what, I'm, on, I'm looking online. They got some over in Pleasanton. Let's go over to Pleasanton. Oh, yeah, let's go over to Hayward. They got some in Hayward, too. So we drove for a couple of hours until about 930 at night. And I noticed it was quiet in the car. And my wife started nodding out on it. <laughs> so I put a U-turn on it and said, thank you, Lord. <laughs> I want to be in the house when they start acting a fool. <laughs> so it was such a good time. And here we are in the new year, and we really, for grace, you know, we always deal with things, and we try to, uh, you know, honor those things by meditating upon them if we can't remember in the scriptures, but certainly unpacking what it means for us. And today we have a commandment, not a commandment really. Yes, it's a command. It's an imperative in verse 21 of chapter 37, but it's also an indicative. It's something that God promises. So mostly what I want you to capture around verse 30, 31 of chapter 37 is a promise. Okay, it's a promise. Now we're going to get there. But we got to work through our text to get there. All promises are only really appreciated when you've gone through hell to get to them. Promises mean very little if you don't discover that God bringing them to pass in your life was at the consequence of tearing up a bunch of stuff and at the consequence of working through your flaws and at the consequence of delivering you over and over and over again. And finally you look up and what God said he would do for you, he did. And you are much more grateful after coming out of a trial into the blessing of that promise more than you ever could have before. Am I making some sense? Title of our message then is Resting in Christ in the reset resting in christ in the reset those of you who are aware of that term reset you will know what i'm talking about broadly narrowly acutely or what have you you will learn more about it over the weeks and months and even years because the whole concept will last about 10 years for the transformation of the world. It would behoove you to learn what you can about what you don't know so that you can be more capable of responding to it from a biblical standpoint. But you and I are going to have a framework around it today. What do you mean by reset? Whenever we talk about a reset, we're basically talking about the climax of a thing and therefore a transition from one mode of existence to another. Whenever we talk about a reset, we're talking about a change. Whenever we talk about a reset, we are making the inference or assertion that the present situation, the present operation, the present status is either no more valid, functional, dysfunctional, and therefore needs to be uh, removed. Whenever you talk about a reset, you're talking about calling that which presently exists invalid, 
non-beneficial and therefore must be replaced with something else. Ask what you mean by a reset. It's inferring that what is presently working will no longer work going forward and we need to be deliberate and intentional about the change. Well, I'll tell you what. There are people in this world who have determined to do that and you need to know that. But just in case you are incredulous, and Christians often are, because we don't always think like God thinks, I want to help you biblically understand that resets have occurred over and over again in the Word of God, and they have occurred as an opportunity for God to demonstrate His power and His grace in the midst of the arrogance of mankind. I will assert to you that Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 5 was a reset. I will assert to you that the serpent himself thought that he had a better, better plan for this world than God did. And I will assert to you that the fundamentals of, as we learned a week ago, rebellion, redemption, and rescue had to be employed at that attempted reset. I will again uh, uh, remind you that in your Bible, you found another reset taking place in Genesis chapter 6, where God looked and he saw that the heart of man was evil only continually, and that mankind had once again planned to dominate the world and fill it with marauders. That is your Nephilim. These are your Anakim. Not some hybrid of monsters and demons and humans. The Anakim were your big dogs. Your Anakim and your, your, um, your Nephilim were your marauders. They were your kings. They were your governors. They were your princes. Today, they would be your elite. They would be your wealthy. They would be your money barons. Today, they would be the powerful in the highest regions of government and economics today. Your marauders are your thugs. They are your mafia. They are the ones who actually can come together in groups and strategize how to shape the world. Am I making sense? That's what we're dealing with. Get away from Greek mythology. We don't have a hybrid of demons and human beings. That is not ontologically possible. That is not biblical. So you don't have to get distracted by those shows that tell you that we've got skeletons of Anakim that are 12, 15 feet tall. That's just a human being that God allowed to have an abnormal uh, uh, hormonal development from time to time. Those were abnormalities. Don't fall prey for that kind of stuff. That was a reset. What did God do in that reset? He intervened before the world was completely dominated by the global agenda in Genesis 6. How did he intervene? As he always does, with a dynamic of the gospel as a mission to redeem his elect before he brings judgment. The next reset attempted was in Genesis chapter 10 and 11. When the men of, of Noah's family decided that they were going to build a city and a tower to God in order that they would not lose their unity and common language and common goals, that was a reset attempt. And what did God do? He busted that up too in his mercy and goodness and scattered men to the four heavens and told them right where you are, you will seek my face. Acts chapter 14 and Acts chapter 17, the next major reset you and I discover in the word of God has largely to do with the nation of Israel coming up out of its incubation period where God told Abraham for 430 years, your seed will be in Egypt, starting with 72 people, Jacob and his family. Do you guys remember? And they would grow to be like the stars of the sky and the sands of the sea. Do you remember? And God in his mercy, because Pharaoh, the one that did not know Joseph, decided to kill all of the male children in his mad attempt at syncretizing all the peoples under his authority, minus the true and the living God. See, all of it was to destroy the seed that should come. And that seed is who? Jesus. And so what does God do? He interrupted again, didn't he? He showed up in a glorious plan of redemption to manifest his power and he thwarted that reset 
But in that attempt, he moved Israel on up out of that planned destruction into their purpose in Christ. Once Israel gets into the land, sorry to say, there are a couple of other reset attempts taking place. I'm just going to give you a couple more to help you understand that you are not being told something that is so bizarre and so uncommon to the people of God. I want you to be discerning people in the year 2021. There's nothing new under the sun. This world is not a friend of grace. It does not love God. I'm talking about the world system. I'm not talking people in general, and I'm not talking our physical world. I'm talking systems of this world. You have to at all times know that the systems of this world, according to Revelation 7, uh, 17, 14, are gathering together against the Lamb. At all times, you got to know that even though you don't hear about it, even though you don't see it, you've got to know that there is a diabolical system under the governance of Satan with all of his fallen angels working in the hearts of mankind to oppose the glory of God, a biblical worldview and a right kind of living before God that honors him. You got to know that that's going on. At all times, and you've got to know that the people of God everywhere in the world have to come up against the challenge of a massive political agenda that is going to challenge the people of God in what might be called another reset. That's where we are now. But the one that bothers me that might be applicable to where we are in our world with our church was the blessed auspicious position that Solomon had to actually be the heir to the throne of King David, who was really the first king of Israel, not Saul. Saul was a wicked man that the people wanted. He was the people's king. God's covenant was always with Judah. So you need to know that. So Solomon comes up out of the greatest king in the world, King David. And he was a great emblem of Jesus Christ in that his glory and the glory of the temple that he was called to build drew men and women from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Solomon's one particular calling was to build the temple, was it not? And that temple was so beautiful, kings from everywhere came. But as God would show you and me how liable we are to failure and mistakes, even in the midst of our privileged position, as was Solomon, we have a tendency to take our privileges and pervert them. And Solomon perverted his privileges by allowing it to be about him. And the next thing you know, he's marrying 700 wives, 300 concubines. And most of that was political affinity that opened the door for syncretism. Y'all learned that. I know some is syncretism is the conflation of religious systems together under a pseudo harmony that is really no harmony at all. Solomon then began to give us the framework, the Solomonic, what we would call catastrophe, began to give us the framework for the Masonic system of the world. Solomon began to give, give us a framework for Catholicism. Anyone that understands Masonic philosophy knows I'm telling the truth. Anyone whose parents have been there know they are operating out of a Solomonic paradigm of wisdom. And human brotherhood at the expense of the gospel of the grace of God in Christ. And building a world out of human wisdom and mathematics and science as God had given Solomon wisdom. And seeking to produce a false peace. That's the name Shalom. That's where Solomon comes from. Are you guys hearing me? And God had to bust that thing up royally too. Because it was a reset that didn't give God glory. And the final time I want to talk about a reset in, re in relationship to where we are and where we're going was the reset that happened in A.D. 33. When the Lord Jesus Christ became the epitome of the Reformation. That term is only used one time in your Bible and it's in the book of Hebrews where God says he brought about a reformation of ending the old covenant, establishing the new covenant, and bringing men and women into a right relationship with God, not through religion, but through a person, and that person is Christ. True reformation is the work of God. 
But then God would tell us that the enemy has a hell bent desire to constantly mimic God, doesn't he? And so we always have to be careful of the mimicking of the wicked one in its attempt to be like God, because in the process, what he does is he deceives the masses who are not rooted. And this is where this new year is going to be helpful and important for us to didactically bore down into the whole concept of what it means to be rooted. In our account, you're going to see an example of someone who is rooted and those who follow him are rooted as well. This is going to be a brief but a necessary example of a vivid warfare conflict, an attempt on the part of the enemy to reset the kingdom of God again. But God grants wisdom to his leadership and his people to manifest being rooted and so not to be swept away by the diabolical arguments of the wicked. Are y'all following me? Point number one, then in our outline, the threat of the reset announced Point number two, the threat of the reset absorbed. And point number three, the threat of the reset answered. There's a lot to be said about all three, quite frankly, because I love the word of God. And there are a lot of rich, really important principles. But I'm going to see if I can expedite this so that we can have the table. But I want you to think it through with me. The threat of the reset announced really opens up. In chapter uh, 36, verse 1 and 2, notice how the language is given. Let's work with two major uh, minor sub points under point number one, the threat of the reset announced. Now we're dealing with the attack on the part of the Assyrian uh, kingdom coming after Israel on its way to go to war with Egypt. Notice what it tells us in verse 1 and 2. Now in the now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Shennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the defense cities of Judah. Now here's the part I want you to get. And took them. I want you to get this. I want you to understand that the enemy came and the enemy actually took the warrior tribes. Now who are the warrior tribes? The Judites. And will you notice the text said fenced cities. So the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, and his, his, uh, his spokesperson, Rapshekah, they came and they actually were able to subdue the most formidable army of Israel. Now, you guys know this, don't you? Here's what you know. Whenever the enemy comes against the people of God and the people of God fall, it's because they sinned against God. You must know that by, inher by inherently. Don't d just grab that and keep moving with it because it would have never been possible for that to occur if there had not been corruption on the part of the Judites. I'll talk about that in a moment. So when chapter 36 opens up, what it's saying is the enemy is making advancement into the areas of the kingdom of God from which they should not because the watchmen are not watching. They have penetrated into the most formidable part of the military. Now, what does this do mentally for people? It shakes them up. It shakes them up. It shakes them up. Look at verse 2. And the king of Assyria sent Rapshaka from Lachish to Jerusalem under King Hezekiah with a great army, with a great army, not a little army, a great army. Now, this is not, this is not all of the Assyrian army. This is simply a representative of the Assyrian army. With here now, this would be a spokesperson. Rapshaka would be an ambassador for the king. Are you hearing me? But he has a large enough, formidable enough military presence that a conversation ensues. Because the Judites have been taken and now here he is standing out in front of Hezekiah. Now ready to bring Hezekiah down if he doesn't submit. So now we have a conversation. Now we have a dialogue. Now we have a narrative. This is the context of the uh, spiritual exercise for you and me today. Two kings, Hezekiah and Shennacherib. Two battles, the battle against the flesh and the spirit, the battle against the dark rim and the rim of light, the battle against this secular world and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what you are hearing right here. This is what you're seeing. And so it tells us that he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field, which was an elaborate pool that Hezekiah had built in his prosperity and in his wealth. Now, all of a sudden, Hezekiah is confronted with a king that he has known for a while has been actually taking territory all around him. 
So you and I are looking at a drama unfolding, and I want to just call your attention to two subpoints here. Subpoint A, the arrogance of its argument. The arrogance of its argument. There could be a whole lot said about that, but I just want you to understand a few things. Look at verse 5 through verse 7 for me. And this is Rapshika responding to uh, the, uh, the uh, king of Israel, uh, king of Judah rather, and his people by opening his mouth and saying, this is what he said. I'm going to start at verse 4. And Rapshika said unto them, Say ye now to Hezekiah, Tell Hezekiah, Thus said the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is there wherein you trust? Now notice what he's doing. He's getting ready to challenge their faith. So the opening of his challenging narrative argument monologue attacks faith. Because confidence is faith. Wherein does your faith lie? May I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that's always the battle against you with every narrative you hear in the world. Every lofty doctrine. Every lofty agenda. Every plan, every goal that says we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And wherein is your confidence to oppose it? Every time you hear anything politically, socially, spiritually that will come up against the counsel of the living God, you are tried in your faith. You and I are tried every day by the media. You and I are tried every day by the world system as to where is your confidence? See, we call this psyop. This is psychological warfare. The goal of the enemy has always been to first speak in your ears. Find the throne of your confidence and begin to gradually whittle away at it so it crumbles under you. See, in warfare, you don't just shoot a bomb first. You start talking. You start a conversation. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? It's always about rhetoric. And this is what's going on in our world right now. Rhetoric! So if you got time, I want to help you understand that don't think that the enemy has not come after you simply because you haven't seen him or there has not been some concrete changes in your life. He could have easily already overthrown your faith if you and I are not examining constantly where is my confidence. And if you are so easily moved by narratives, if you are so easily hoodwinked by assumptions, If you and I are so easily controlled by authorities other than God. If you and I are so easily buying into statistics and numbers and the repetition of images and framed narratives. If we're easily being moved by them. If they are defining for us reality, we're already crumbling. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Can I keep talking? See, it's important to know not only that my eyes are open, but my ears are open as well. Because the enemy has always started his attack by talking. So I told one of my sisters a week ago when she said, Pastor, why is it that the devil was able to hoodwink Eve? And I said, because she failed to realize he had no business talking to her. See, that's straight up country going all the way back to Louisiana. No bitterness talking to her. She had succumbed to pantheism when in fact God had created her to rule over him. The snake had no reason opening his mouth and talking with a level of equality with mankind. She should have told him, you're out of order. Shut up. But because she woke up on the wrong side of the bed, She was a pantheist. And you got a lot of Christian pantheists today that buy into narratives that have absolutely no authority over you. And that's how the enemy works, doesn't he? He pretends to have authority. And he will challenge you by wearing a garb that would suggest to anyone watching, let's see whether or not she knows the word of God. Let's see if he knows the word of God. Let's see if they're biblically based, sound presuppositionalists who know the hierarchical government of this world. Let's see if that Christian is not simply a pretending Christian. Do they know that they are created in the Imago Dei? 
Do they know that they have been given authority over everything on the planet? Do they not know that they're there to be the vicar of God for the good of humanity and for the glory of God? Do they know that? Or do they have the assumption that they can talk to the creature and the creature can talk to them and that God is really in the creature and the creature is in God and now we're dealing with panamism, aren't we? And that's where we are in our Christianity today, too. So Rapshika is speaking and he's saying, where is your confidence? Look at verse five. I say, says thou, but they are but vain words. What is he doing now? He's basically repeating briefly an assumption on the part of the king towards Israel. Watch this. I have counsel and strength for war. This is Rapshika. Now, whom do you trust that you would rebel against me? He's making the argument that if you don't do what I say, you're rebelling. You see how he's shaping the narrative? You see how he's formulating the argument, how he's building his case on premises that are not really substantially valid, but they will be if you believe the premise. If you believe the premise that he is a great king, that he is a great sovereign, and that no one can stop him, then it makes sense that what you're doing by merely standing there is rebelling against him. Raise your hand if y'all tracking with me so I can keep going. So it is with our government. They put out a foolish decree. And then we, we either collapse under it or we keep moving like we know who they are, men. And when they look up and see the people of God realizing they're just men and we're going to obey God rather than men, then now all of a sudden we're, re we're rebelling. But we aren't even contemplating the thought that we're rebelling. We are far from rebelling, Shennacherib. We're far from rebelling, Rapshika. We're far from rebelling, Goosem. I didn't twist that. We're far from rebelling. We're obeying the one true and living God who is the foundation of our identity and the sovereign of our life. We're far from oh, disobeying. We're far from rebelling. Today, we're obeying God by his grace. And notice how the narrative continues. I want you to see this again. I can talk at length about all three stages here, but it's just enough for you and I to understand we're dealing with the same thing. He said, but if you say to me, we trust in the Lord, our God, and we do. Is it not he whose high places, whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar. Now you better hear what he just did. He just made a division between the hypocrites in Israel and the true believers. Now, I know you don't get it, but I'm going to help you right here. This here again is called psychological warfare. This is how you divide and conquer. This is how you expose the secular and carnal in the religious system from the faithful and the true and the living God. See, Hezekiah had done what God had told him to do. Do you know what that was? Tear down all the false idols. And bring Israel back to the one true and living God. But the hypocrites in Israel felt like he was being unjust because they got a new idea about how to serve God. So what did Rapture could do? He really was doing a dog whistle to all of the hypocrites in the church. Are y'all hearing me? This is called divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Now notice what verse 8 says. A couple more verses. And then we'll look at my second point. Now, therefore, give a pledge, I pray thee, to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you be able on your part to set riders upon them. Can I tell you what he did right there now? He imposed upon you a kind of derogatory statement that's basically designed to cause you now to shrink up under his proposition. You know what he just said? You're nothing. You're nothing. He says, I'll give you 2,000 horses and I guarantee you, your man can't sit on them. That is to say, you don't have even enough people to sit on the horses that I would give you. Again, he's playing with their head. You know what he's doing? He's getting them to turn and look at themselves. He's getting them to ask the question, do we have enough numbers on our part to actually challenge just this representative army, not the whole army of, of Assyria? Now, I'm going to show you there's more to this than this, but here's how the enemy also works. Please hear me. And this one is hard for Christians because we don't pick up on this one for a long time. 
The enemy works by getting you to think that this battle is about you. See? The enemy works by getting you to think that this battle is about you. Now, this is going to be the strategic thing that's going to move us into our third point, where the king has gloriously manifested a right wisdom. But one of the things you have to be careful to do when you enter into spiritual warfare or you find yourself in the midst of a spiritual battle, you have to be careful. You have to be careful to make sure that you aren't the greatest culprit in that conflict. You have to be careful. And it's hard. It's hard. We're going to be having an ROE in two weeks. It's in your bulletin. Rules of engagement. Going to be dealing with fundamentals. It's going to be a fundamentals class. And anyone and everyone can be there. Anyone and everyone, particularly if you're thinking about getting married. you thinking about it. You need to be there. Because we're going to deal with fundamentals. And one of the fundamentals for all of us around relationships is we make the mistake of thinking that it's about us. And the enemy loves for you to do that. Here, here, he basically challenged them on the grounds of who they were, not on the grounds of who God was, not on the grounds of what God has, not on the grounds of God's arsenal, God's military, God's resources. He wasn't even wanting them to think that way. So what does the enemy like to do? He like to get you in a corner and cause you to start thinking that this whole thing is about you. The moment you and I make it about us, we are just about lost in whatever battle we are fighting. Whatever battle we're fighting, we're about to lose because it's about us. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And this is what makes this even more tragic along those lines, children of God, is because... As you should know, this particular battle was not Israel's battle. It was the Lord's. So I want, I want you to capture this too. So not only under point number one are we dealing with the reset announced, what, what uh, Shennacherib is going to do, and the arrogance of his argument, and we'll look at more checks on that. Now I want you to deal with the assumption of his audience. Here's what he assumes about Israel. Look over at verse 12. You heard this, and I saw some of you guys respond a little bit to it, but I want you to catch this. Here's what he assumes over in verse 12. But Rapshika said, Hath my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, that they may eat their own dong and drink their own piss with you? Woo! Do you understand what uh, Hilkiah uh, and what, Eli uh, what Eliakim had stated and the uh, recorder? Eliakim is the high priest. This is the one we talked about on Christmas Day. He's a great type of Christ. He's mediating because you don't send the king down there because they'll kill him. You send other people. You send an embassy. Okay. Uh, Eliakim is the high priest and the scribe is the writer of the message. And what he, what the, what uh, Eliakim had said was to Rapshika, would you speak to us in a language by which our people will not hear you? Let's dialogue discreetly. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's good politics. All right? That's good politics. And this is good for the domestic family as well. When husbands and wives get crazy and stupid and go to war, that's what we're going to talk about in two weeks. When we go to war, you should be smart enough to go to war where the kids don't have to hear everything you're talking about. That's free. And see, out of concern, because there had not been a formidable agreement or disagreement, why let the soldiers or why let the people actually hear what's being said? In governments all around the world, that's what we do. We go behind closed doors and we try to draw up agreements that will satisfy all parties before we have to tell the people what to do. That's called discretion. This notion about full disclosure, be careful that you're not hoodwinked by that term. Do you guys hear me? The idea of full disclosure? The idea of full disclosure a lot of times is a way to actually get you put in a disadvantaged state. Whosoever discovers another to another is not a lover, he's not a friend, he's a hater. You have to know when it's time to open up and when it's time to keep shut. You have to know when to give information and when not. Am I making sense? Yeah. Why Jesus did not say everything while he was with the disciples. He said, I can only give you so much. And the notion of wanting our government to tell us everything. No, you don't. 
No, you don't. You do not want your government opening up all the books. You don't want them sharing with you all the information. Wisdom always deals in knowledge. Wisdom always meets out knowledge according to the good and the objects of its good. Did y'all hear what I just stated? You don't just open your mouth like a fool and tell everything. The enemy would love that to occur. Even with what's going on now. Because we live in a free market with people running their mouth everywhere. And they are and they should because they're free. I'd rather hear a bunch of fools talking than for the powers that be to cut me off from being able to preach the gospel. Are you hearing what I'm getting here? So, so I'm just sharing some things with you that's important. I can filter error. I can filter falsehood. I can reserve. I can put it. I can hinder dialogue and conversation that comes after me. I can do that. What I don't want to be told is you can't speak. But in this context, when you're dealing with representatives of a government, as Eliakim, the wise high priest is, he's wanting to make sure that his men are not demoralized by propaganda. And this also would tell me that there's some insights given here. And what that would say to me is Eliakim, the high priest, knows that Judah is compromised. Can I share that with you? Like, see, like when you know your children, and I'm using the metaphor of a father being the govern governance in the citizenry and the children being weak because they're carnal and idolatrous and self-centered. And now they're having to have to deal with, you know, the consequences. Still, as a good parent, you don't want them to be exposed to something they can't handle. But what does Shennacherib do? He laughs. He says, I didn't come out here to speak to you. I came out here to provoke your men, your people, to commit treason against you. Did you guys get that? To turn you against your own people, which is what has been happening in America for decades. Ideological subversion has set America up for what is the present division in our country and the almost civil war that's on the brink. Nothing glorious about it at all. Do you hear me? We learned this a few weeks ago. A kingdom divided cannot stand. Once the division starts taking place, you know the enemy has come in and cut it at the roots. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's so important to get this. And so to go here on the part of the uh, dialogue, on the part of the uh, narrative is for the people to be intimidated, to be threatened, that they might drink their own piss and eat their own dung. Do you know what that means? That means that uh, Rapshika believes that if they just simply do a siege, remember what they do. We learned this in the Revelation series. You come, you have a conversation, and then you siege the city. You besiege it. Y'all following? You don't, you don't kill them, you, you seize them. Because you get in their head. You starve them to death. And once you start starving them to death, they start turning on each other. And that's what's going on in our country spiritually. Even this last year of COVID has exponentially ramped up the spiritual starvation and has got people eating each other. I'm telling the truth. I'm telling the God honest truth. People are eating each other up right now. This is why, by God's grace, I said, all right, we're going to get in the new year. I'm going to deal with the whole concept of the reset. We're going to have a, hopefully have a beautiful presentation about the gospel next week as we deal with the arts of grace. Week after that, we're doing an ROE. Because I know the challenge on the part of our families. The statistics are out there everywhere across the nation. Do you understand that? And every one of us needs to really reevaluate how well we are doing in areas of relationship because the goal of the enemy is to destroy it. Do you hear me? To utterly destroy it. So we will be working through some fundamentals two weeks from now to deal with that. And so here we are under point number, uh, sub point B, the, 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 the language that he uses. Look at verse 14 through 17. And he said it before we go to point number two. Thus said the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you for shall not for he shall not be able to deliver you, neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. Whoa. Saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus said the king of Assyria, 
make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me and eat ye every one of his vine and every one of his fig tree and drink ye every one of the waters of his cistern. I wish I had time. I wish I had time. This man understands the theology behind the political promises God made Israel. This here is what we call eschatological motifs. What do we mean that? This is a millennial language that when you walk in righteousness, God blesses you with vine trees and fig trees under your own roof. That every man would have sufficiency by God's grace when you walk in the righteousness of God that's in Christ. Essentially what Rapshika is saying is Hezekiah can't bring you into the millennium. But we can. Y'all following me? Please hear me now. So the secular, demonic, godless, antichrist, demonic system is going to bring you into the rest of the millennium? Did you get it? All right, I'll leave that there because it's going to come up again in a few years for us. So the promise of God to his, his people, his elect at all times, when you are in covenant with God through Christ, Christ is your head. We are his body. He is the bridegroom. We're the bride. The bridegroom has provided a total rest package for his elect. Has he not? And rest for God's elect does not simply mean going to sleep. It means that we have everything necessary for life and godliness through a knowledge of God. That our great husband, the Lord Jesus Christ, provides for us, he protects us, and he produces through us. That's what we learn to be a Hebrew man, is to be a provider, a protector, and a producer. That's what it means, and Jesus gets the job done, doesn't he? And all of us are called to that same paradigm. And that's where rest comes in. When you know your bills are going to get paid, you can rest. When you know you're going to have enough food on the table, you can rest. When you know that God is the kind of God that can make a way out of no way, you can rest while he does that. Right. This is the God that calls us unto his rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will rest you. Not give you rest. I will rest you. Rest me, Lord. It's so important for you to get this because I'm getting ready to get into the, the deeper elements of the psychological battle, because here, listen to me, children of God, listen, listen carefully. If you're not resting, something's wrong. Something's wrong if you're not resting. Are you hearing me? And, and you're certainly in a problem when if you have all of the external material things by which there should be a kind of rest by analogy. And you're not. It means something is awry, either at the root or at the practice. Am I making some sense? Because God promises rest for his elect. And this is extremely important here because the enemy is, he's, what he's doing here is looking for all the people that are not resting. All the people who are saying in their head, the Lord does not provide. The Lord is not sufficient. The Lord has not brought us into abundance. The Lord does not take care of us. And whenever you are thinking like that, there's always a devil that's willing to come along and bring you into his false narrative. The Bible tells me godliness with contentment is great thing. It's great gain. God tells me that he's able to make me abound and make me into a base. And I'm all right with that. So long as I have God, I'm good. I know how to put just a little bit on some red beans and some pinto beans. I know how to do it. Don't we, sister? I know how to eat a nice bowl of beans and say, thank you, Lord. I see the glory of God in these beans right here. I know they point to a full of blessing on the other side of the universe. See, in other words, I can take the parable and understand what it points to. He can cause all grace to abound even in our, in our small measures. He can multiply the loaves in our life. Can he not? And sometimes we need him to do that. Because we can be operating out of the carnal so long. But we need to go on spiritual diets. Now we talked about that a few weeks ago. I'm going to leave that alone because people get mad at me when I talk like that. 
So the man goes on to say over in verse 17, until I come and take you away to a land like your own, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. There he is. I'm going to take you out of your promise into our presence. And we're going to show you that we got the same thing over here that you have over there. Now, that's called false religion. That's false religion. A lot of people have transitioned out of the gospel into that kind of false religion because they had not taken root downward to bear fruit upward. They're not rooted. They're not rooted. Y'all understand what I'm getting at? When you're not rooted, the wind can blow and you can easily be moved. Very important for you to get this. Get a copy of this CD or whatever and hold on to it for a year and then come back to it in a year and see whether or not God's speaking. Okay, in a year. In a year. Notice what he says in verse 18. Beware lest has Hezekiah persuade you, saying the Lord will deliver us. Have any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphid? Where are the gods of Zephyrium? Where, where have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Get out the way. God's getting ready to kick some tail. Get out the way. God's getting ready to kick some tail and I'm trying to keep it clean in 21. Right. And, and so here's what will happen, too. It's very important for you to get it, how the enemy works. So when the enemy rises, raises his head using intellectually discreet and measured words, eventually he loses his discretion. Y'all know how snakes are. Yeah, after a while, as he's talking, the hiss comes out. Hiss, hiss. And then you see it for what it is. The hiss is coming out. The hiss is coming out. Even your God can't stop me. Do you hear that? Even your God can't stop me. Now, I'm telling you, saints, that's a test. Even now for people. Even your God can't protect you against this, can't protect you against that. Even your God can't keep you. Your God can't keep you from our statistics. Your God can't keep you from our arguments. Your God can't keep you from what we're estimating. Yes, he can. We have a God that can keep us in all matters. We have a God that can provide for us even in the famine. We have a God that can cover us, shield us. Provide for us, protect us in the midst of all evil. Do we not? Here's your problem. Here's your problem. Now it's a time or an opportunity to try that over against the enemy. Will you? Will you trust God in 21 as you had to trust him in 20? In 20? And will you actually go deeper in your trust in 21 than you did in 20? Will you allow your roots to go deeper into God so that your tree trunk can go broader, so your limbs can go wider, so your fruit can be clearer in 21 than it was in 20? Uh, now, child of God, see, when you go to talk, my Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I want to honor you. Lord, I want to be a vessel for your pleasure. I want to be a vessel, meet for your glory. God heard that. But so did the devil. And the devil getting ready to try you whether or not you were sincere with those words. See, every step we take to glorify God is met with adversity. God didn't lie to us. Isn't that what he told us? And he told us to prepare for it. He said, gird up the loins of your mind. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He told us to do that. So we can't be cowering. We can't be wimping out. Hezekiah getting ready to show us how to do it. Now, there was another lie this man said that I just want you to capture. I thought this earlier, but I'm just going to tell you. This was, this was slick. This was slick. Let me see here. Where is this at? Over in chapter, uh, let me see if it's 37, 10. Uh, no, let me see. Verse 10, chapter 36, verse 10. And am I now come up without the Lord against this and to destroy it? The Lord said unto me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now, do you know he then took the name of the Lord in vain? He then turned into a Christian. He didn't become the president of the United States. 
You know how our presidents get saved right before they start running for election. I told you that they get a big old King James Bible, twice as big as this one, big one, with a cross on it. And then they get saved. Don't they get saved right before we get hoodwinked to, to make them president? Every time. Every time. Every time. So now he's religious. Now, now Jesus is on his side. He just said the Lord sent me to destroy Jerusalem. Saint, was he telling the truth or was he lying? He was a lying sack of crap from the pit of hell like his daddy, was he not? He was a liar from the beginning and the truth is not in him. He doesn't know the truth and he can never speak the truth. But here comes the challenge on the part of undiscerning Christians of buying the lie as the truth and swearing that God is doing this for our good. Am I, am I making sense? Right. This brother threw out all the arsenal at him, didn't he? Didn't he? He threw out all the arsenal. Point number two. Got something else to show you here. Point number two. Give me a little bit more time. The threat of the reset announced. Point one. The threat of the reset what? Absorbed. I wish I had time to talk about martial arts today. See, when you grow up in the hood, you have to fight. Like, so I, I felt so bad for my elder as he got up here and started reading about Shanakarib and, and then Rapsheka and then all of a sudden it's Rashika. And it's, I'm like, ah, I'm sorry, Lord, I forgot the brother didn't grow up in the hood. I done taught y'all we use two at the most three syllables. He could have just went rash. He could have went sin. He, I said, Lord, deliver him. Remember, deliver him. And then that brother pivoted well, didn't he? he? Did he pivot? He says, I ain't grew up in the hood, but I know how to handle them when they come. That brother dropped some word on us, didn't he? Point number two says the threat of the reset of Zorp, and this has to do with the strategy that I'm going to lay down now that's going to be important for you to capture. Look at chapter 36, verse 20, and then 21. Chapter 36, 20, and 21. I want you to see this now. Chapter 36, 20. Notice what it says here. Uh, when he uses the language, who are they among all the gods of the land that have delivered you out of my hand? Look at verse 21. Are you there? But they did what? They held their peace. Now I want you to mark that because we're getting ready to teach something here. They held their peace and here's the exegetical, the explanation of it. They did not answer him back. All right. So there's a lot to learn here. There's a lot to learn here because there's a kind of silence that's cowardice. There's a kind of silence that is paralysis of the mind where you don't know how to respond when you have been blitzed by all kinds of narratives that are threatening. There's a kind of silence that basically will also admit that you are capitulating to the authority of what's said. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? In debates, this will occur when an enemy uh, an adversary or a proponent has thought that he has won that initial opening argument and then it's uh, opportunity for his opponent to respond and the opponent doesn't respond carnal people fleshly people who love war will say he's not responding it must mean that the individual is right are y'all hearing me nothing could be further from the truth and in fact here's the other side of it I want to warn you about child of God so I can build this it's not always wise to have a right answer right away it's not always wise to be ready to answer them quickly. It's not always God's wisdom for you and I to go tit for tat in arguments. I'm going to pick up on that in the ROE two weeks from now. It's not always he says something and then she says something. Or she says something and then, then he says it back. Wise people know how to thoughtfully regard what's said. Do you understand what I just stated? Carefully regard what's said and carefully prepare to speak. Now, see, this is where I quoted the Proverbs. The fool utters all his mind right away. But the righteous, wise man, the prudent man holds it in until afterwards. Y'all got that? 
This is where true confidence and true faith comes in for believers who are called, hear me now, to be like Christ. Because I'm getting ready to show you a Christ-like paradigm around this second point. Absorbing, absorbing the reset. Absorbing the reset. He told them to hold their peace and answer them not a word. Do you see that? Under point number two, there are three sub points I want to richly pour your thoughts into. Sub point A, this is a gospel principle of what? Faith. Yes, it is. Sub point B, it's a gospel principle of what? Faith. And sub point C, it's a gospel principle of humility. The first place I want you to go with this is in uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 32, verse 17 and 18. We've been here before, but I want you to get it. Now, notice. Isaiah 32, that means we're only a few chapters back, right? If we're running as a historical narrative, this is what you can know. When you and I run across narratives that are dealing with like conflict scenarios and conflict battles, what you want to read are the chapters before and the chapters after. Did I make some good sense? Right, now watch this. Here's the reason why. Because a lot of times the battle is the place where God is about to display the wisdom that he gave in previous chapters. Y'all got that? Right. The battle is the context in which when God makes promises, he's now about to prove the benefit of those promises if you walk in them. Because God will give you promises before he allows you to get into the midst of battles. Because he wants to instruct you and I on how to negotiate battles in a way that glorifies him and we not collapse in our own strength. And then also, when you are looking at historical narratives in contexts where there are conflicts or battles, not only look at that narrative that is in its context, but look at the outcome and the extended outcome. Here in this context, Hezekiah has well taught his people how to prepare for something that Isaiah has been telling Israel was coming since the seventh chapter of Isaiah. Okay? So like when the preacher tells you it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and then he teaches you how to handle it so that when it comes, you handle it well. That's what's going on here. All right, so notice what it says in Isaiah chapter 32, 17. Now the work of righteousness shall be what? What righteousness are we talking about? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. What work are we talking about? The cross work of the Son of God that obtained eternal redemption for us, that purchased for us the right to stand before God as his Son. What is the outcome of being made righteous in Christ? Peace. Now the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Values and commodities of the kingdom of God that can never be taken from you without your permission. Values and qualities in the kingdom of God that can never be taken from you without your permission. And the effect of righteousness, what? Quietness and assurance forever. I, I, let me go back to that little parenthetical because I see some of you struggling with it. So right, peace is objective and peace is subjective. Peace is eternal in terms of our position, but peace is also temporal in terms of our submission to the obedience to Christ. Sometimes your peace is taken away. That's because your head's on backwards or when you're walking in rebellion. I was talking to one of the saints about this a couple of days ago because they were struggling between being forgiven eternally and immutably and unchangeably by the work of Christ objectively for us on the cross and yet having to go to the Father and ask for forgiveness when we sin. And so you know there are people who hold a position that if you're the righteousness of God in Christ, you never have to ask for forgiveness. And I say you will never ask for forgiveness if you do not believe that the gospel brings you into a relationship. You will only assume that you don't have to talk to God. If what the gospel did was give you a card that you can put in your back pocket and say that once you get to the pearly gates, you accepted Jesus and now you get to get in. But if the gospel is God reconciling himself to you 
If God placing his spirit in you, if the gospel is redeeming you and making you a son of God, if the gospel is taking you from sin to redemption and leading you to glory, then God's conforming you to the image of his darling son. And in the process of that conformity, you and I are not better than David. You and I are not better than Asa. You and I are not better than Moses. We're not better than Aaron. If they had to confess their sins, you and I do too. Not because we're losing our salvation, but because we love God enough to want to have fellowship with God on the grounds of the blood of Christ that's able to cleanse my conscience when I get way beside, when I get outside myself. When I get outside myself and think I can run this world on my own and the Holy Ghost steps back and lets me fall flat on my face. And the next thing I know, I'm drying up like a tree whose roots are not going deep into the water bank. And the Holy Ghost teaches me now how to cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. And it makes all the sense in the world to have a God. I want you to get this now. It makes all the sense in the world to have a God who is ready to forgive, ready to show mercy. The moment that you cry, you ain't even got to even say it. You just cry. Is that good or what? Just cry. That's what our, our prodigal brother did. He cried and the Holy Ghost turned him around. By the time he got into the presence of the father, the father said, I already know. Shut up. Put your clothes on. Let's party. That's my translation. Because see, the kingdom of God is about joy. I don't know about you. But see, the father was secure. That was his son. He was happy to have him back home. And that's how it is with you and me. When we get far, far, far from home in rebellion and disobedience, the Holy Ghost is going to tighten the reins. And bring you to a place where you confess that you are simultaneously sinful and righteous at the same time. And one day when glory snatches you up and fills your whole being with its ontological fullness, you will never sin again. But until that day, whosoever says he does not have sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. He that said he had no sin does not know the truth. I'm so glad I got a God who dealt with it and is dealing with it. I got to teach you something here, though, because this concept of peace is a beautiful concept. Isaiah tells us that this, this is what God has afforded us. It goes also back to Isaiah 30, verse 15. Go to Isaiah 30, 15. You can work these texts. The gospel has afforded all of God's elect a quality of peace that can be threatened, but it can never be taken away. It, you will have to be humbled on some occasions to talk to God with snot and tears. Have you ever done that? I'm talking about snot and tears. I'm talking about real babies in the house, right? It's not just, he clear out your whole system. When you come up off your chair, your whole system is cleared up. You feel like a new man, a new woman, don't you? And, 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 and you marvel because this is how good God is to you, child of God. Can I talk to you? This is how good God is to you. This is how good God is to me. Like you marvel that you aren't on your knees every day. I want you to get this because the Holy Ghost is not pe keeping you on pins and needles. He's called you to grace. He can live with your sin. He paid for it. Oh, that's good. He's a good daddy. He let you act a fool a long time. Right. And then and, here, and watch this. And you go, I, and I know I'm going to get my, I know it's coming. And he'll just let you go a long time because the foundation of his relationship with you is love. It's not legalism. Did you hear what I just stated? It's love. It's not legalism. It's Christ's righteousness, not yours. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? He's he going to let you go a long time and you're going to grow up after that. You're going to go, oh, I get it now. He delights to show mercy. And he's giving me an opportunity to actually willingly want to walk in his precepts. I get it now. I get it now. He's actually instilling in me the virtue to make right choices. 
and not simply live in the compunction or the drive of my carnal nature. Grow me up, O oh Lord. So I can live more in the honor of the freedom of the gospel that brings you glory because I'm really not satisfied when I have my way anyway. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not satisfied. God's best for me is way better than my best for me at all times. Look at Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. Notice what it says. But thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning, that's called repentance, in returning, that's called repentance. And in what? You shall be what? I loved it. See, now, this is a principle God has laid down all the way through the word of God. Now, let me help you with this word rest. I'm going to give you two more verses and keep it moving. Can I do that? The word peace back in our text. And they held their peace. It's a term that really means to, watch this now, plot, plan, devise, and so. That's crazy, isn't it? Watch this. It's a word that means plot, plan, divide, and so. I'm just going to give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about. Now watch this. When the believer holds his peace, it doesn't mean his brain is empty. When the believer holds his peace, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have a strategy. When the believer holds his peace, it doesn't mean he's merely waiting on some solution to come. In the gospel sense of holding your peace, it means you already have a plan inside that allows you to not have to act in kind towards a fool. Did y'all get what I just stated? Answer, not a fool. Did you get that? Now, is Shennacherib a fool? Didn't I just argue that that man was a fool from the moment he showed up? Now, why are you going to argue with a fool? Because if you do, you're going to be what? Like him. And the reason you hold your peace is because God has given you a counsel that is far superior than his rhetoric. God has provided for you insights and wisdom and strategies and ways to go that are far more excellent than the folly that came out of his mouth. I'm going to quickly point you to three examples. One, I'm going to start with the highest example that you and I can go to. His name is the Lord Jesus. When he stood before Pilate, when he stood before Caiaphas, when he stood before Herod, what did he do? Hail his peace. That wasn't because our Lord didn't have anything in his brain. He is the infinite, eternal word of God. He is the wisdom of God. He is the counsel of God. But he was also aware that he was standing before fools. And there's no knowledge, nor counsel, or wisdom against the Lord. All of that crap that was coming out of Rapshika's mouth and Shennacherib's mouth and Herod's mouth and Pilate's mouth. I could let you go. I could kill you. Jesus said you couldn't do anything if my daddy didn't give you room to do it. So when I say here this the term peace here is what's in view. It's the peace that was the counsel given to the children of Israel in Exodus chapter 14, 14, when God had brought them out. Pull it up. Exodus 14, 14. I shocked her up there. Exodus 14, 14. <laughs> you can't go to sleep on me, girl. You on my team. 14, 14, where Israel has been coming out of Egypt all night long. Because it was midnight. They walked out of Egypt. They headed to the Red Sea. They look up and the Red Sea is in front of them and Pharaoh's behind them. Now, here comes Pharaoh. He's furious. Furious. His son dead. There's, there really is no negotiating going on here. What you going to do, child of God, when they come for you? What you going to do? What you going to do? What you going to do, child of God, when they come for you? You going to turn around and argue? Are you going to trust in the true and the living God? You going to turn around and debate them con for con? Are you going to remember the promises of the word of God? 
Here the promises of the word of God is, and it has always been that way from the beginning of time. The Lord shall fight for you. The Lord shall fight for you. Here is your counsel. Hold your peace. Ooh, if that's not good, I don't know what is. Oh, I, if that's not good, I don't know. So, so here's the sign. Here's the sign. When you actually believe that the battle is the Lord's, and you actually believe that God's fighting your battles, then you can actually take the promise to keep your mouth shut, because this ain't about you. It's about him. And now all you got to do is wait for God to shut up, be, uh, show up, because when you shut up, he's going to show up. Now stay there now. I want you to get it, because this is hard to do. It's hard to cut your brain off. It's hard to cut your mind off. It's hard to cut your emotions off. It's hard to cut off what you need to do and how you need to do it and when you need to do it. And all that's indicating is you haven't rooted yourself in that promise to believe that this is God's battle. And that God will show up soon enough so that your holding your peace ought to be a sign. Woo! It ought to be a sign. It ought to be a sign. Israel, in their first battle encampment and engagement in the land of Palestine, walked around Jericho six days, holding their what? Why? It wasn't because their brains were empty. It wasn't because they didn't have counsel. It wasn't because they didn't have a plot. They didn't have a plan. They didn't have a methodology. They did. They had God's word. They had God's counsel. They, got, they had God's will. Now watch. They were plotting in their mind. They were plowing in their mind. They were sowing good seed in their mind. They didn't have to say it out loud. Am I making some sense? One more verse. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19. Now this is Elijah having went through major campaigns for God, Israel is in a very low ebb with Ahab ruling the kingdom, where his wife was really ruling. Uh, you know, Kamala was really ruling. I know I'm messing with people. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and she's going after the man of God now. And the man of God is tired, ready to go home to glory. And what does God do? He prepares his mentor to now ride with him for the next several months before he shuts it down. I want to show you an insight here. This is 1 Kings 19. So Elijah departed from where he was and found Elisha, the son of Shepherd. Now you guys know that Elisha is about to take up the ministry of Elijah. Do y'all know that? Elisha is a great type of the church. Elijah is a great type of Christ. Haven't I taught y'all that? So the ushering up into heaven of Elijah mandated that Elisha saw his ascension. So that in seeing his ascension, the mantle would be given to Elisha. In the same way that the apostles saw the ascension of Christ and they waited for the Holy Ghost to come not many days hence. Do y'all understand what I'm getting at? Now, now I want to show you something here. This is really important because in the historical context, Elisha is doing something that you and I should be doing as we wait on God. It says he was doing what? He was doing what? He was holding his peace. That's our word. He's holding his peace. How you tied it together? Just the Greek translation of the same word, Hebrew translation of the same word. He was holding his peace. Watch this now. He was holding his peace with 12 yoke of oxen before him. Now, what was he doing? He was plowing. Wasn't he? He was doing what? He's plotting up the follow ground, breaking it up, wasn't he? He's breaking it up that follow ground in order, 
in detail the right way because his job is to do what? Sow. Sow. Sow the good seed of the gospel so that that good seed could do what? Take root downward and bear fruit upward. And he was holding his peace while he was doing it because God was preparing him to take Elijah's place. So while he was in preparation, he was getting about the business of holding his peace. Have we not all been called to hold our peace evangelically? Have we not all been called to hold our peace by staying like the ox, treading out the corn, sowing the good seed that it might bear good fruit? Has he not called us to that peace? That's the peace that our text is talking about. So when I used the term plot, that's a proverb alternative to the term peace that's in our Isaiah text. When I used the term plow, that is the first king's alternative to the word. Plotting and plowing are the same thing when you take the metaphor and understand that in our minds, we're called to labor. In our hearts, we're called to sow good seed. In our minds, we're to think through what's right, think through what's sound, think through what's good. We're to cultivate in our hearts biblical truth. You and I are to take the counsel of God, the incorruptible seed, and in the peace that we have in Christ, sow it in our hearts so that it bears forth fruit upward, taking root downward. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? This is critically important for you and I in this new year. And he, he with the 12, and Elijah passed by him and did what? Cast his mantle on him. A great reset is about to happen in the life of Elijah, isn't it? He's about to go to glory, and that other brother is about to take up his ministry as well. Go back to our text. I want to wrap it up here so we can partake of the table. In our text, when we read Isaiah chapter 36, uh, 37 rather, when we read uh, what's going on here, uh, uh, Hezekiah is plainly laying out for the people of God how to function. Point number two, the threat of the reset absorbed under three manifestations, gospel principles of faith. Faith is the substance of what? And it's the evidence of things what? Faithful men and women will not be found acting like unfaithful men and women. I want to draw that principle home so we can keep it moving. In the year 2020, you and I should find ourselves doing more peace sowing, peace plotting. Do you understand that? Peace sowing, peace plotting than running off at the mouth. Speaking foolishly out of ignorance or out of fear. Getting wrapped up in politics, getting wrapped up in religion, getting wrapped up in anything other than, as it were, minding the matters of the kingdom as Elisha was. Waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to come, to cast his grace upon us, that we might move to that next level of ministry. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I could stay right there and show you the chaos that was going on in Elisha's day told you the kingdom had got turned upside down by those two fools. Elisha could have been complaining like Christians do all over the place. What is Elisha doing? Holding his what? Just treading out the corn, plowing the ground, breaking up the fallow ground, sowing the good seed. He's doing what all of us should be doing, praying and meditating Studying the word of God, communing with the father, cultivating in one another's hearts room for the good seed to be sown in our heart. So God can water that seed and cause that seed to grow in us. Let them look at us and they will see us doing nothing other than minding our own business. I love what Hezekiah was doing. He told them to act as if. They didn't hear a thing he said. Now, I just want you to hear the promise, and this is where I'm going to close so we can partake of the table. Point number three. I'm not going to even unpack this. Point number three. The threat of the reset what? So we've dealt with the threat of the reset announced. We have looked at the threat of the reset absorbed. And finally, I'm just going to close with... Uh, the subpoint assertions in verses 20 through 23 of chapter 37, because this, this discussion goes on at length. <clears throat> 
In chapter 37, verse 30, notice what it says. This is this is God talking now to Hezekiah, because you guys do know that Hezekiah, after he heard all of that crazy foolishness, went to God in prayer. If y'all don't know that, read all of chapter 36 and 7. Hezekiah took it and said, Lord, you heard what he said. You know why he did that? Because Hezekiah knew that that was God's battle. It wasn't his. He took it to God. Now, notice how God responds. He says, this will be a sign unto you. Are you ready? You shall eat this year such as grows of itself. Did not talk about this last week. Yeah, I, I gave you the promise last week. Watch this. You shall eat of that which grows this year of that which grows of itself. And the second year, that which springs of the same. And then third years, you shall what? And then you shall what? And you shall what? And you shall what? As if that fool Shinnacharib didn't even show up. Nothing in your life is going to change when you keep your mind on God. You're going to continue to sow and you're going to continue to reap and you're going to continue the benefit of sowing and reaping because you believe that God will provide for you that the promises of God will not fail. Now that's going to be an act of faith. To keep it moving as if you only have one authority, and that is God. Anybody hear what I'm saying? Because I want to close it down right here. Look at the next verse, and this is the verse that you and I want to work through for the rest of the year. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah. Do you see it? And the remnant. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm done now, but I just really want you to think this through. The people that escape are the ones who are going to enjoy the promise. Because, see, they're in the middle of a war. People are dying. People are being brought into captivity. People are being killed. You and I are in the middle of a war. But the ones that escape will be able to operate out of the principle given in verse 31 and uh, verse 30. And here's the fruit in verse 31. Those that escape of the house of Judah shall again do what? Take root down. Now, see, this is so beautiful, so beautiful, because really what it's talking about is the growth and expansion of the people of God. It's talking about the growth and expansion of the Judite kingdom. It's talking about preserving the seed of Christ until he comes. And how is it preserved? By the obedience of the people who keep it moving, who keep quiet, who keep plotting, who keep plowing, who keep sowing, while God keep blessing his promise to feed you year in and year out, week in and week out, month in and month out, as if in your own life nothing has ever happened of any substantial significance that you and I should be troubled. Is not the Lord able to provide for us in what's about to take place in 21? Now, if you and I believe that, then, then we want to take up this promise of sowing downward and reaping upward. Under sub point three, there are two sub points, and I just want to state that I'm done. This is the Lord's battle. The one in Hezekiah's day and today is the Lord's battle. Do you understand that? This is the Lord's battle. So listen to the CD again and, and be reproved where you need to be reproved because I can tell you what the enemy does is everything that we learned in our main first point. Get our head backwards. Get us going carnal. Get us thinking it's about us. Get us running off at the mouth without authority. Now y'all hearing what I'm saying? It's the Lord's battle. The Lord's battle. And God will do what? Resist the proud. Won't he? Will he resist the proud? Do you know what God said to them? Shennacherib won't even come near you. He won't fire one arrow. The next morning, all their men were dead. God acted the way he did in Egypt, the way he did in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the way God acts throughout the whole of the book of the Revelation when God's saints hold their peace. He uses heaven and earth to fight his battles to show that he's the sovereign of the universe. That everyone might know that he is the God of heaven and earth. 
and not some little local God. Did y'all hear what I just said? Don't let me start preaching again. When you hold your peace, God fights your battles in a way that he shows that he's the one that controls amoebas. He's the one that controls viruses. He's the one that controls human beings. God have mercy. I believe him. I believe him so much. I believe him so much. And he gives grace to the humble. Doesn't he? He gives grace to the humble. We're going to pick up this principle next week because I want to take us into a little bit more of a exegetical understanding of taking root downward and bearing fruit upward so that we can experience that blessing today. We're going to have the uh, offering at this time and then the Lord's table.